these sampling distributions. The Seattle Epidemiology Research and Information Center, in collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Employee Education System, and the University of Washington Department of Epidemiology, present the 2002 VA Epidemiology Summer Session. Welcome back to General Biostatistics. I'm Marie Diener West from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And since this is our last meeting, I thought that we should probably review today's homework. So today's homework is actually um, from a study that was looking at um, seven subjects who had been smokers. And it was a study to look at saliva cotinine levels. So seven subjects were asked to refrain from smoking for a week. And then cotinine levels were measured at 12 hours after smoking a single cigarette. And then again, 24 hours after smoking. So here we have two continuous measurements. Um, at 24 hours and uh, 12 hours. And we may be interested in looking at the linear relationship between these two continuous variables. So here we have seven points uh, illustrating the relationship between the 12 and 24 hour measurements for each of the seven individuals. What we see is that we have um, what could appear to be, if I put my pen through this, um, somewhat of a linear relationship, a positive linear relationship. We see that as the 12-hour measurement goes up, correspondingly the 24-hour measurement appears to be high. So based on this, by visually inspecting the graph, we could then use our knowledge of the um, form of a simple linear regression line expressing the relationship between x and y by solving first for the estimated slope um, using this relationship. So taking the data values that we have for both the 12 hour, the x's, and the 24 hour, the y's, for both, we would see that um, after going through the math that the estimated slope is 0.3486. So in other words, that says for each one unit increase in the 12 hour level of cotinine, there's a 0.3486 or approximately 0.35 increase in the 24-hour uh, um, level. And these are measured in terms of micromolars per liter. So once we have that estimated slope, we can easily solve for the um, estimated y-intercept by taking the mean value of the y, remember the y was the 24-hour levels, so the average 24-hour level, minus the estimated slope of negative 0.3486, times the mean of the x's, which in this case was the mean 12-hour level. And we would see that that intercept is 6.077. So again, that intercept isn't very meaningful. It tells us that if the 12-hour level of cotinine was 0, um, the expected 24-hour level would be 6. But in fact, when we looked at our data, the data ranged only between about 15 micromolars per liter and 160 micromolars per liter for the 12-hour measures. So what we're really interested in is interpreting that um, slope or um, the change in the 12-hour level, um, the change in the 24-hour level relative to a one-unit change in the 12-hour level. So we would see here's the form of the best-fitting line. The predicted line y hat equals the estimated intercept of 6.077 plus the slope of 0 0.3486 times x. And we could use this line for prediction. So for instance, for an individual with a 12-hour level of 60 micromolars per liter, the predicted 24-hour level for that individual would be solved by plugging in 60 for x, and we would see that it's approximately 27 micromolars per liter. So I could, based on now having that form of the straight or the best fitting line, it's the one that really minimizes the sums of the square differences between each point and the line. I would be able to, um, to draw that. What I'm going to do is show you what we would see if we used um, Stata. So here um, I could graph the 24-hour measure versus the 12-hour measure, 
and my scatter plot shows pretty much what the artist did by hand. And we see that there's um, a positive linear relationship. So as the after at the 12 hour level increases, so does the 24 hour level. And I could also graph um, the same thing, but um, I have a predicted value that I've calculated based on that regression line. And I'm going to also um, show you that line. So what we have now is that best fitting line, the one, the best line that, that minimizes the sum of the square differences of each point from the line. And that's the line that has the slope that's equal to, what did we say it was? 0.34, about 0.35 micromolars per um, liter increase in the 24 hour per each one unit increase in the 12 hour. So this is the form of the line. And I could also perform a regression. I actually had to do this regression uh, first in order to get that fitted line. But I could regress the after 24 measure on the 12 hour measure. And what we see here now is the estimated slope of 0.35, that coefficient estimated as 6.07. Now, if we were testing the null hypothesis that the slope equals 0, the p-value is about 0.082. So in fact, would we reject or fail to reject a null hypothesis that the slope is equal to 0? We'd fail to reject. And in fact, we could look as well at the 95% confidence interval for the true slope. What we see is that it ranges from a negative value, 0.06, to a positive value of 0.76. This interval includes 0. And so based on either inspecting the confidence interval or um, the p-value, we really would not reject the null hypothesis. We'd conclude that it does appear that the slope is equal to 0. So how can I make sense of this? Remember, if I graphed this, I saw what appeared to be a straight line relationship with a positive slope. But in fact, what might be my problem here? Too few observations. So I only have seven observations. I'm able to fit a straight line through anything. As long as I have two points, I can fit a straight line through it. Um, but the, the estimated slope is not statistically significant because we see the confidence interval includes 0. The p-value is greater than 0.05. Let's look, too, at the r squared value. So the r squared is about 0.48, indicating that less than half of the variability in the 24-hour um, levels can be explained by the relationship with the 12-hour levels. So, um, this might change if we increase the sample size. There may be a, a significant relationship. But, um, but what I'd like to emphasize is looking at the confidence interval, which would tell us that um, we're 95% confident that this interval that ranges from a, about a 0.06 unit decrease up to a 0.76 unit increase could, could contain the true slope, which we would interpret as the true um, increase in 24-hour level measurements relative to a one-unit increase in 12-hour measurements. Okay, so you know we haven't had the opportunity to spend a lot of time on this concept. We haven't been able to take this beyond simple linear regression to a multiple linear regression using multiple covariates. But I'm hoping that you see that the same principles of hypothesis testing and confidence interval estimation still apply. We're just interpreting now the slopes, the estimated coefficients, as opposed to sample statistics that are means or proportions or differences in means or proportions. Okay. Well, I think if you have any questions, we have a few minutes for questions on regression analysis. Otherwise, what we're going to do is roll back the clock and look at what we've covered over the past five um, sessions and see if you have any questions along the way. OK. Any questions on this last topic? OK. So just in summary, where we've been over the past five sessions is uh, actually covering a lot of material. Although this is introductory or general biostatistics, we've covered a lot. 
Uh, we started out by looking at defining biostatistics with respect to the use of statistics in biology, in health and medicine. And some of you have asked me, well, you know, what's really the difference between statistics used in other um, applications versus biostatistics? And uh, what we've done is we've looked at some, most of the common techniques used in um, applications to health and, and uh, medicine and biology. Um, much of the underlying principles are the same in statistics. Statistical methods and um, methods of inference are the same, whether it's in business or management um, or in health and medicine. But there are um, techniques that are sometimes used more um, specifically in business or, or um, management. There are other techniques that may be used more specifically in the social sciences than the ones we've covered here. But um, the underlying premise of hypothesis testing and confidence interval estimation remains the same. We um, began by looking at the data, describing um, data using descriptive statistics. We looked at exploratory data analysis techniques for looking at the entire data set, identifying the shape of the data, um, outliers, and we looked at common ways of summarizing information. Then we moved on and set up the basis of statistical inference by looking at sampling distributions as the framework for both confidence interval estimation and hypothesis testing. And then we spent a lot of time on common statistical methods, tests and estimation for one group or two group comparisons of either means or proportions. We extended that to three groups with analysis of variance and chi-square. We spent a session on sample size and power, and then we ended this by looking at the linear relationship between two variables uh, with simple linear regression. So we're going to take this walk down memory lane and see if you have any questions that have come up um, as in retrospect, now that we're um, five sessions into this. So just a, a reminder that biostatistics uses tools of probability and probability distributions, and in particular, the normal probability distribution or the Gaussian distribution. So we spent time on defining probability as a way of quantifying certainty, um, as a way of expressing the likelihood that an event or characteristic occurs. And biostatistics really then provides us with tools for dealing with uncertainty and dealing with variation or variability in data. So biostatistics uses the tools of probability and sets up methods then that allow us to describe and summarize natural phenomena that allow us to assess the strength of evidence for or against a hypothesis and uh, allows us then to make some conclusions um, based on these methods. So first of all, we looked at the exploratory data analysis and we emphasized two of the techniques that have been developed by um, John Tukey with um, very clever names, the stem and leaf display and the box and whiskers plot. And the stem and leaf display is no more than a histogram turned on its side. So the stems are the categories that we can um, classify as groupings for continuous data. The leaves were just the units for each of those stems. And if we turned the stem and leaf on the side, its side, we'd see a histogram. But the stem and leaf display allowed us to look at the minimum value and the maximum value at a glance. It allowed us to look at the shape of the distribution. It allowed us to see if there were, it was a mode or multiple modes. And um, it retained all of the information in each of the groups. The box and whiskers plot was one that allowed us, again, to graphically look at all of the data. The box, remember, was the middle 50%, the interquartile range. The whiskers extended up to the maximum value and down to the minimum value. And there was a technique that was um, referred to as seeing whether observations fell outside the fences that would identify outliers. So the fences are not drawn on the box and whisker plot. The fences are just a way of identifying outliers. So does anybody remember how a fence is defined? In English? <laughs> Actually, it's not. 
So um, the, the response was you know, potentially two standard deviations. No, with a box and whiskers plot itself, we're looking at the middle 50% where we would say this is the majority of observations. And we're looking at one and a half times that distance. So think of this is the middle 50%. One and a half times is about this much. If observations are this much above the, the upper 75th percentile or this much below the lower 25th percentile, there may be something wrong with them. <laughs> so the, that's just a technique for flagging or identifying values that don't hang together with the middle 50% of observations. Why is it one and a half times? It's arbitrary. It's arbitrary, but it's just a guideline for um, detecting outliers. And what would you do with the outliers? You'd look at them, so you would check them. You'd go back and see, are they correct? Is it a data entry error? Is there something wrong? So it's just a way of looking at your data. Um, we talked about looking at data in tables and graphs, and throughout the course we've looked at some examples. We spent time talking about summarizing data because often, instead of using the entire data set, data are summarized either by their measure of central tendency, in other words, an average or mean, median or mode, or the measure of spread, which could be the simple range, the difference between the maximum and the minimum, could be the interquartile range, the middle 50%, or um, the measure of standard deviation or variance. So we looked at um, measures of spread, and in particular, plus or minus two standard deviations or measures of standard deviations when we looked at um, the normal distribution in particular. Before, um, we, before we looked at methods of setting up um, statistical inferences, we um, laid the framework that, in fact, what we most of the time have is not an entire population, but just a subset or a sample. Or we've done a study which is based on a group of individuals that we could consider to be a subset or sample of a population. So we defined that a parameter is a summary measure, like mean or standard deviation, that we can compute from a population, whereas a statistic is an estimate. It's a summary measure we compute from a sample. So statistical inference aims to use our knowledge based on the data we've collected and can summarize in a statistics to make an inference or a conclusion about the true but unknown population parameter. So statistical inference attempts to say something about the unknown truth, the population, based on the information we've collected from the data of a sample. We spent time on developing the concept of a theoretical sampling distribution of a sample statistic. So we looked at how can we describe the probability associated with the possible values that a sample statistic can take under, um, under a certain assumptions or hypotheses. So the sampling distribution that we looked at was either that of the sample mean or a difference in two sample means sample proportion or a difference in two sample proportions. But the sampling distribution then gave us an idea of the central tendency of the sample statistics as well as an idea of the variability or spread in the possible values of the sample statistic. So although that was a difficult concept to, to try to um, handle, I'm hoping that if you continue to look at the applets to make some sense of that, that um, although you know, we spent some time on it because we wanted to look at it as the underpinnings of statistical inference, um, you never will be constructing a sampling distribution because you never would have the data from all possible samples to construct it yourself. It's just a theoretical distribution. So remember that there were two methods of statistical inference. One was estimation, doesn't require a null hypothesis. It's based on taking, um, estimating a population parameter by using a statistic. So in fact, a sample statistic, like the sample mean, is a point estimate. Um, a confidence interval estimate takes the sample statistic, adds and subtracts the z or t value times the standard error of the sample statistic. So this was the general form. An example of it would be to take x bar plus or minus z or t 
times the standard error of the mean that we get by taking s over the square root of n. And we saw that the precision of the estimate increases with increasing sample size. So in the example of using a sample mean, it's because the square root of n is in the denominator of the standard error. So with increasing sample size, the standard error decreases. What happens to the confidence interval? Narrows. And the, um, also influencing it is if we wanted a 95% confidence interval, and, and instead we're interested in a 99% confidence interval, what would happen? With increasing confidence, the confidence interval would, would increase because the z value would increase. If we were interested in a 90% confidence interval, the z value would decrease and the confidence interval would always also decrease. Okay. We also looked at another method of making an inference, hypothesis testing which is one that requires a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. We said that in hypothesis testing, our aim is to try to minimize two possible errors. Alpha, the probability of a type 1 error, which says rejecting the null hypothesis when it's really true. And beta, the probability of a type 2 error, which is the probability of failing to reject the null hypothesis when it's really false. So we'd like to just minimize our mistakes We'd have to declare up front the magnitude of a clinically relevant difference by setting the null hypothesis and the alternative. So our aim is to minimize errors, determine what's our minimum clinically relevant difference, and then maximize the sample size based on that. The aim is to be able to reject the null hypothesis and then make a conclusion that the alternative appears to be true. So we set up a null hypothesis, especially in a two-group comparison, versus an alternative that there's a clinically meaningful delta or difference of interest with the hope of being able to conclude that um, the alternative appears to be true. Okay. Any questions up to this point in time? So we're just reviewing where we've been. <laughs> we've gone through some homework examples with each of these. So we used a Z or a T test to compare means of two groups. So when we had continuous data and we're interested in means, we could use a Z or a T test. When did we use a T? Well, the key for using a T is when we have unknown population standard deviation. If the sample size is large enough, then that T becomes close to a Z. But the real rationale for using a T is because of unknown sigma unknown population standard deviation. We saw that when we actually had before and after measurements, such as in a pre and post um, test design, with pair match data, it really reduces to a single sample test of differences that we could e express as a t-test. We looked at comparing proportions between two groups. We focused on the chi-squared test, but we could have performed a z-test as well, a z-test of proportions. And then we looked at comparing means of three or more groups using analysis of, of variance by partitioning the variability in the outcomes into how much variability existed between groups and how much variability exists within groups. So the rationale underlying analysis of variance is that if there's just as much variability between groups as within, what does it tell us about the means? So think of three different groups. If we have just as much variability between those three groups as within groups, we'd expect the average or the mean level to be about the same. On the other hand, if we have more variability between groups than within, then we'd expect the mean level to be different. So that was the whole premise of analysis of variance. We set up a global test that all of the means are the same based on an f-test, and we saw that if the f-test was significant, meaning the p-value was less than 0.05, we'd conclude that at least one of the means was different. And then we would go on to look at a Bonferroni adjustment for making t-tests based on comparing two groups, pairwise comparisons. 
And then we extended this to dichotomous outcomes and looking at differences in proportions in three or more groups using the chi-square statistic. Any burning questions that have come about as a result of reviewing or reading based on these methods? We um, looked at the methods first, and then we looked at the components of sample size and power. So although we knew that some of our inferences based on hypothesis testing and confidence interval estimation were influenced by sample size, um, before conducting a study, one would want to look at um, estimating the appropriate sample size and take the um, appropriate components into consideration. So what are the components of sample size? It depends on whether we're looking at a one group situation or looking at differences between two groups. We would take into account the possibility of type 1 and type 2 errors, try to minimize those errors. We'd have to have some estimate of the variability in the observations. So by this, either some estimate of the standard deviation for a continuous measure or some estimate of P for a dichotomous measure. As well, we would, especially in a two-sample case, be interested in defining the clinically relevant difference of interest. So these are the components of sample size. And we saw when we um, looked at some examples that sample size inherently increases when we, ha when we assume smaller probabilities of type 1 and type 2 error. So if we try to minimize our, samples, our alpha and beta, the smaller we try to make those assumed errors, below 0.05 for alpha or be below 0.2 for beta, we would need an increase in sample size. We also saw that the larger the variability in our observations, the larger sample size would be required to be. And in order to detect a small clinically relevant difference, if we decrease the clinically relevant difference of interest, again, our sample size requirements would increase. So we saw those relationships. And we saw that the statistical power of a hypothesis test is implicitly related to sample size as well as related to the magnitude of the clinically relevant difference that we're interested in detecting. So we saw that the power to detect a particular difference of interest increases with increasing sample size. We saw that the power to detect a, a difference of interest decreases with increasing variability or spread in the observations. So just two key um, points to keep in mind that um, one can modify the statistical power um, depending on the, the difference that you're considering to be clinically important. One can also see that having increased variability in a data set will also influence the power. <coughs> Questions on sample size or power? And then lastly, the last method we looked at was simple linear regression. We focused on correlation analysis, which allows us to describe the strength and the direction, meaning either a positive or negative linear relationship between two continuous variables. Remember that based on the data, if we calculated a sample correlation of zero, that would indicate no linear correlation. A sample correlation coefficient of positive one would indicate a perfect positive linear relationship and a sample correlation of negative 1 would indicate a perfect negative correlation. We then showed that regression analysis allows us to calculate the best fitting, the form of the best fitting straight line, and allows us to make a prediction of one variable, of the dependent variable, based on the value of the independent variable. So we've covered in five sessions all of those topics, hopefully highlighting some of the practical implications of each um, and a little bit of the theoretical underpinnings. What's next? There's a lot more. <laughs> this was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we didn't approach the area of mul multiple linear regression, which al allows us to look at linear relationships between one continuous response variable and multiple predictor variables. We haven't looked at 
the relationship between a dichotomous outcome and multiple predictor variables. That's the context of multiple logistic regression analysis. And often in clinical research, Cox regression analysis or the Cox proportional hazards model is a form of multivariable analysis that allows us to look at the time to an event or the risk of a response based on multiple predictors. So we could actually spend courses on each of these three topics. We could spend semesters on each of these three topics. Um, but I hope that this has provided a basis for you, a framework in terms of interpreting one and two variable relationships that you could use then as a basis for um, continued thought on interpreting multiple variable relationships. So this is where we'll stop. We have time for any kind of question at this point, within reason. And um, go from there. Uh, see, question in the front here. I have a question about where single subject design fits into biostatistics and if it does. So a single group design? Um, even single subject. Oh, OK. okay. You know, if you're looking at some multiple baselines, some type of treatment outcome and so okay. forth. So this is a good question. The question was about single subject designs. Now certainly um, a single subject design would be where you have one subject and you're looking at a baseline and then potentially multiple follow-ups over time. So this would allow you to look at how much variability there is in measurements for that single subject. Um, often a single subject design wouldn't be um, advisable unless it's a situation in which um, the, the resources or the uniqueness or rareness of the condition prevent you from obtaining other subjects. So in order to calculate variability or standard deviation or variance, you need at least two observations. Um, because if you think of the formulation for sample variance, you're looking at the sum of the square differences between each value and their mean, and you divide by n minus 1. So in order to look at variability, you'd need at least two. Um, there, are, there are studies that um, are, are, uh, have more follow-ups than subjects. And so there are ways for calculating sample size to maximize the number of follow-ups and minimize the number of subjects so that you could look at both variability between subjects as well as, well as variability in observations for a particular subject. But, um, but a single subject would only allow you to describe a single subject, and it's difficult to make inferences back to a population based on just a sample size of one. Good day. My name's Gail Ryber. I'm the director of the VA Summer Epidemiology Program. We have just finished our fourth annual conference, and we're here on the University of Washington campus talking about issues that are important to epidemiologists in terms of their research. Today I have with me Dr. Robert Perlman. Dr. Perlman is a gerontologist. He is at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System. He's very involved in the National VA Patient Ethics Center. Dr. Perlman, tell us about the National Center. I'd be happy to. Uh, the National Center is, the, the real name, the formal name is the National Center for Ethics in Healthcare. And it's been in existence for about 10, 11 years. In the last two years, it's actually expanded, I think, threefold in size. So now the administrative core of the center uh, and the people who work on policy are situated in Washington, D.C. There's a whole staff in New York at the Manhattan VA. Uh, that focuses on education and consultation. And then there are people in Seattle, such as myself, who are focusing on evaluation. So what are some of the priorities for the Ethics Center? Well, thanks for asking. That's a great question. Um, for many people, ethics is just this vague sense of trying to do good and avoid harm, and there's some right and wrong. Uh, I think that where the Ethics Center is unique in, is in its commitment to um, sort of promote ethics quality in healthcare. The center, and Ellen Fox is the director of the center, believes strongly that um, just like technical quality and service quality, there's ethics quality. 
In other words, as an example, you can have a great surgeon and um, you can have great access, but if basically there's a leg amputation and the patient didn't want to have their leg amputated, there would be a problem with quality in an ethics fashion. So there's the promotion of ethics quality, and of course, if you're going to try to promote something and do something about it, it has to be measurable. So part of the uh, current initiatives that are ongoing is figuring out how to measure ethics quality in healthcare. So what are some of the hot issues in ethics today? Well, let me anchor it to what we're trying to measure, because we're, we're at a very early stage of the development of trying to measure quali quality. Um, so one, one of the things that we're measuring is the ethical culture. Uh, it's been shown that in organizations that have high ethical culture, you know, perceived culture, uh, that there's uh, greater efficiency, better productivity, less turnover, uh, you know, a whole myriad of, 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 of good outcomes. So that's one issue. There's the classic clinical issues that come up within clinical ethics, such as uh, shared de decision making, end of life care, privacy and confidentiality, especially in the VA with its computerized medical records, professionalism. Uh, and then there's both the sort of clinical and the organizational issue of resource allocation in terms of it being fair, open, transparent, informed, and well justified. As an ethicist, do you get involved in patient care decisions? Well, that's different than, well, I do. Uh, I do, but I don't uh, as, uh, in, within my role as the evaluation coordinator for the center. Uh, I do because, in fact, I also am the director of the ethics program at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System. So in that capacity, I chair the ethics committee, I direct an ethics consultation service, and several months a year I'm involved performing ethics consultations. So anyone in the medical center who perceives there's an ethical, to be an ethical problem, can arrange to call in a band of consultants, um, usually just a couple people, and we collect information, try to understand what's going on, and try to provide um, advisory guidance to facilitate the perceived problem. What are some of the topics that people have clinical issues regarding ethics? Well, in, in part, uh, I think because the population of the VA is aging, many of the issues that we see pertain to end-of-life care and shared decision-making. So, for example, issues pertain to um, appropriate withholding or withdrawing of life-sustaining treatment. Uh, similarly, there are issues pertaining to uh, decision-making and decision-making capacity of the individual. Does the person have sufficient understanding and appreciation of the situation to be making an informed choice? And when a patient doesn't, who's the appropriate surrogate decision maker and um, how should communication occur with that individual and what happens when that individual seems to be expressing sentiments that uh, are in conflict with previously expressed sentiments by the patient. Um, these must be pretty dicey issues. Uh, are these the same issues that you do your own research on? Lo and behold, they are. Uh, Yes, it's made for a career that's a wonderful merger of clinical interests and research interests. And as you know, uh, you know, my research career has focused on the role of quality of life and decision making, physician assisted suicide, advanced care planning, things describe like that. Describe one of your studies for us. I'll describe one that was funded by the VA. Uh, seems most appropriate. Um, several years ago, I was funded to develop a workbook, a patient-centered workbook to help patients, their family members, and health care healthcare providers engage in advanced care planning. And by that, I mean um, it's, a, it's a means to help patients think about, communicate, and document their wishes for care if they ever end up in a situation where they can't speak for themselves. In a, from an ethics perspective, it's a way to sort of ensure respect for the patient and promote their self-determination when they lost capacity. So uh, the VA funded a project to develop a workbook uh, to aid in this regard. And um, through a series of focus groups and interviews and pilot testing uh, with individuals in the field and with a special emphasis on, cul on cultural competence and sensitivity, we developed a workbook. 
and then were funded, and then we were funded to conduct a randomized control trial to see whether it would make a difference. And uh, what we showed, although it's not in formal press yet, uh, what we showed is that uh, use of the workbook with uh, some assistance from social work service uh, leads to uh, increased documentation of advanced care directives, uh, increased flagging of charts so that everyone's aware of it, um, increased shared understanding on the part of healthcare provi providers of patients' preferences for treatment and of their values that might be relevant to decisions. So we were able to have those kinds of effects. So where, what's your next step with regard to implementing the results of your clinical trial? Well, the, the first next step has been uh, to put that onto the web. So it's available through the VA intro website, uh, and you can actually download the booklet, which is called Your Life, Your Choices, for free. So that's one mechanism of access. And then we're looking at other ways of getting the booklet out. Locally, we've actually uh, abridged the booklet and last year sent it to 43,000 veterans with a cover letter saying, this is a good thing. You should think about it and contact us if you're interested. And we're sending out a reminder in a few weeks to do the same. Do very many of the veterans take advantage of this advanced care planning? Do very many of them have uh, formal documents in place? Uh, well, it depends how you define very many. Um, I think in the country as a whole, approximately 15 to 20 percent of adults have advanced directives, which are usually a one of two types, either an instructional directive like a living will, something that might say, if I'm ever in a permanent coma or brain damaged, I wouldn't want to be kept alive uh, through artificial means, or something called a proxy directive where the competent patient appoints someone, usually a family member, to represent them if they can't speak for themselves. So on average, it's around 20%. And actually, in our research, the control group was around 20%. With the intervention, we got up to about 46%. And we figure that that's, that's fine. Um, I mean, people shouldn't be coerced into having an advanced directive. They should be um, um, cajoled into thinking about whether they want one or not. And as you mentioned, these are not necessarily static documents. People's preferences change? People's preferences do change. And then it's uh, the responsibility of the individual and healthcare providers to track them over time and see whether uh, changes have occurred, whether old documents need to be ripped up and, uh, and computerized records changed. So it does pose a challenge because as human beings we change our minds. The issue, however, is that when you need it, when a person would need it, they can't tell you whether they've changed their mind. So it's critically important to have something as opposed to just flipping a coin, uh, and also to understand whether that person's been consistent over time or whether they're the type of person who every, every half a year they change their mind. And it's been shown in research, actually in our research locally, that um, without these kinds of documents, the, both the physician's estimates of the patient's wishes, as well as the surrogates, as well as the wife's, let's say, you know, for male veterans, uh, estimates are no better than flipping of a coin. Dr. Perlman, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Good day. My name is Gail Ryber. I'm the director of the VA Summer Epidemiology Program here in Seattle, Washington. I'm also a VA career scientist and a professor of epidemiology and health services at the University of Washington. We are enjoying a wonderful course this uh, summer and we have eight different classes and superb faculty from across the country. One of our faculty members that has joined us from Ann Arbor, Michigan is Eric Stalhanska. Eric works in the VA National Patient Safety Program. He brings an interesting business background and economics background to looking at patient safety problems within the VA. Eric, could you describe the VA Patient Safety Program? Sure, I'd be delighted to. Thanks, Gail. We're the uh, National Program Office located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And as the National Program Office, we are responsible for setting up basically the development and the deployment of the patient safety program throughout all of the VA facilities. We have about 26 staff. And then at each of the local facilities, there's a designated patient safety manager. So that's our liaison. That's the person who makes sure that uh, they're on the front line 
uh, actually implementing the patient safety program at their facilities. At the networks, we also have what we term a patient safety officer. That's a person who helps to coordinate across the different networks. They can share lessons learned between facilities, help to coordinate training needs, and are also an additional liaison with us. We're headed up by Dr. James Bajian, who is an astronaut, physician, engineer. I don't think he has uh, been unsuccessful in anything that he's attempted so far. What are some of the products and services that you provide to the VA hospitals? Well, specifically, one of our major products is patient safety training. Uh, one of the deliverables is a three-day training program that we've taught to over 1,000 people throughout the VA uh, medical centers. And in this three-day training, we basically uh, indoctrinate them into the patient safety mindset for the VA. Uh, we teach them how to conduct root cause analysis investigations and expose them to human factors engineering so that they have a sense of uh, what that means. We really want to have them focus upon system and process issues. In addition, this last year we had quite an extensive training program for proactive risk assessment. The full mouthful is healthcare failure mode and effect analysis, but proactive risk assessment taught people basically to take a look at a situation or a process and think about what might go wrong. What are the vulnerabilities and try and correct those prior to actually having a close call or an adverse event. In addition, we uh, engage in information dissemination. We think that that's something that's very important from our office's perspective. We have a different variety of different ways that we do this. One of them is through our newsletter called TIPS, or Topics in Patient Safety. This comes out about every two months, and it includes specific uh, root cause analysis investigations where we highlight specific cases for medical centers where we think that there's some learning that can take place. We also uh, discuss successes at the local facilities and uh, let them know about alerts or advisories. We encourage people to go to our websites. This is a place where we've put a lot of our teaching tools uh, up so that people have a chance to see what's going on. It's a nice way for us to engage in collaboration and communication across the, the different medical centers. You've received a number of awards for your work in patient safety. Can you tell us about those? Sure. The, the one that's uh, most recent that we uh, feel quite proud of, uh, representative of really the frontline work of the patient safety people, is the Innovations in American Government Award. We just received this in 2001. In 2000, we were a finalist. Now, this is a program that's administered through the Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Government. And uh, last year, we were finalists. We were encouraged to reapply. This year, we were successful. We were the only federal agency that was so recognized and as part of the award we received hundred thousand dollars to use to uh, share information about our program with others. Tell me about some of your successes in the patient safety arena. Well some of the successes that uh, I think are, are worth mentioning are that uh, we've rolled out the facility we've rolled out this program to all of our facilities so in a relatively short span in less than a year there were over a thousand people that were trained at this three-day training uh, in addition, we have patient safety managers and patient safety officers in place in each of our facilities. And I should mention that the VA is the only health care system uh, anywhere in this country and elsewhere that has a dedicated patient safety manager at each facility. Some specific uh, success stories that we feel good about are uh, really the result of individual actions at facilities. Uh, one individual at Mountain Home, Tennessee, has been working with his uh, veterans who are at high risk for falls, and he was involved with uh, looking at hip protectors. He was unhappy with the uh, durability of these products and the design, so he contacted the different companies, the manufacturers, and they're redesigning the products based upon his recommendations. Uh, we also have the situation at another facility where uh, uh, they let us know that there was ongoing mix-ups with what are, what are called Christmas tree connectors and these are to hook up the air and oxygen that are coming out of the wall. Sometimes we would have green connectors hooked up to air which, should, which is the yellow connector coming out of the wall. So what we've done is worked with the manufacturer and he is now manufacturing clear Christmas tree connectors as so that there cannot be that color mix-up. We think that that's something that's a very tangible result of patient safety. Root cause analysis is an interesting concept. Could you explain that to us? Well, we will try. We only have uh, a few minutes here, but root cause analysis is uh, basically one of the, the tools, methodologies that we bring to bear within the patient safety program. It has to do with taking a look at either uh, an actual adverse event where something went wrong or a close call where something almost went wrong. You bring together an interdisciplinary team, and what you're trying to do is to first discover what is it that happened in this particular event. 
And once you have a, a good understanding of that, you engage in literature review. Uh, you uh, will review the charts. You'll take a look at expert witnesses. And uh, then you try and discover why this happened. So we ask that people try and put this uh, into a system and process vulnerability. What are the, so the root cause of this? Oftentimes there's not a single root cause, but instead what we like to think of as contributing factors. And from this then we ask uh, that the local facilities on these interdisciplinary teams come up with effective interventions to try and mitigate these vulnerabilities. Do you have surveillance systems in place so that you can actually look at how effective some of this work is? Well, the surveillance systems are that uh, for each root cause analysis that occurs at the local facilities, they have to not only come up with the initial actions to try and mitigate the vulnerabilities, but quite specific outcome measures. And these are all uh, local facility specific, Gail. So we think that it's absolutely imperative that local facilities come up with effective outcome measures because obviously there's been a local investment made by the, the uh, management in the patient safety program. And we want to be able to show that, in fact, this is a good investment of resources. Sources. So what we suggest for the outcome measures and what we ask people is that they're very specific with defined numerators and denominators, that you have a defined sampling strategy, and that you set your threshold for uh, effective measures. So if you're looking for 100% uh, effectiveness in terms of making sure that everyone who's at high risk for falls is assessed, you establish that. You say that this is what we're going to do. Then the local medical centers will go back and they actually do measure the outcomes to find out has, in fact, the, uh, the actions that they propose been effective. How is it that the VA has become an international leader in patient safety? The reason, by and large, is due to commitment and resources from the top. Initially, Dr. Kaiser uh, has been extraordinarily, was extraordinarily supportive of the patient safety program. So the VA got out front of the patient safety initiative. The following undersecretaries for health, Dr. Garthwaite and now Dr. Roswell, have remained steadfast in their commitment to the patient safety program. Dr. Bayesian reports directly to the undersecretary for health. They made a commitment to have this as an independent program fully funded. And in addition, I would say that uh, the reason that we're able to be successful is that Dr. James Bayesian was chosen as a director. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the challenges that the VA patient safety program faces? I think that uh, one of the, the challenges that we're going to face and we will continue to face is uh, convincing people that this is a worthwhile expenditure of resources. We want them to feel comfortable about uh, uh, staying with, it, with what we're doing and to uh, uh, feel that this, in fact, makes sense. We want to continue to gain buy-in for our program as we work with senior leadership. And so we know that we've made a beachhead. We have uh, a fair number of converts across the system. We need to continue to work with the leaders so that they feel the patient safety is not only morally and ethically the appropriate thing to do, but also a worthwhile expenditure of their resources. Are there research opportunities in patient safety? Oh, I'm glad you asked, Gail. Yes. We are involved with some collaboration with HSRD out of Ann Arbor. Uh, through the HRQ patient safety funding. And in addition, uh, we would encourage anyone who's interested to talk with their local patient safety managers or our office. Uh, this is something where we think that there are a huge number of opportunities. Dr. Demacus within the HSRD is fully supportive of patient safety, and we'd be delighted to uh, look at opportunities to collaborate. So contact us or talk, contact their local patient safety managers. Eric, thank you so much for joining us today and for being on our faculty for the Epidemiology Summer Course. Gail, it was my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.